Welcome everybody to this month's Investing in Identity Form. Your host for today's session, Travis Jure, founder and CEO of Liminal, uh, joined by the typical cast and crew, Cameron D'Ambrosi and Dave Fields. Welcome to the forum, gentlemen. Thank you for having us. Yeah, hope everybody had a nice holiday weekend. Yeah, it was great. Did you guys get out and do anything particularly fun? It was great weather. Yeah. Barbecue, family, all American, wholesome things like that. Ate some hot dogs, ketchup, mustard, you know. Ketchup on your hot dog. Trigger warning. Mm. We have a huge uh, I, I, sorry, I am pro ketchup and I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm also a pro ketchuper. <laughs> it turns out my son is pro ketchup, which is highly, highly disheartening. Did you start to question if he is your son? <sighs> no, I mean, I, I oh, coached man. him this weekend to try mayonnaise to dip his hot dog into and he seemed to like it. So I think... The, the worm is beginning to turn. He's yeah. we'll he generally back. thirsty if he's putting mayonnaise on a hot dog. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, welcome, guys. Uh, obviously, this is our May form, hence the uh, discussion around hot dogs uh, in the park. But uh, so what we're going to talk about today is the bear market. Obviously, uh, we've been dealing with this now for the better part of the last eight weeks, but really seeing this come to fruition uh, through the month of May, that's that's really kind of shaken things up quite a bit, not just in your stock portfolios, but also for all of the private company founders in growth markets like Identity. We're going to talk about that here shortly. And then the acquisition by LexisNexis Risk Solutions with Behaviosec, a very interesting acquisition that um, is no surprise. I mean, LexisNexis Risk Solutions have always been very, very good strategically. So will be really interesting to break into uh, a discussion regarding that acquisition. So let's go ahead and talk about the bear market. Uh, obviously, I think the majority of these sessions have been really talking about how great the market's been, not just for identity companies, but for the entire uh, market here in the US. But as of late, that has not been the case, right? We've seen markets go down 25, 30%. So we're going to spend some time talking about how this market uh, is currently functioning and what you as a business owner or an investor in the space should be thinking about. So we've listed out three questions based off of some listener feedback. And the first main question is, what does a bear market mean for high growth sectors like identity? So thinking more broadly, Dave, you're the uh, the finance finance guy on the call. So maybe we'll we'll kind of let you lead some of these here. What what does this bear market mean for high growth sectors like identity? Yeah, so quickly, I mean, let's define a bear market, um, which is different than a recession, which um, is far more comp actually far more complicated to define. Um, but a bear market is usually just defined as a 20% drawdown in, um, from the most recent high to um, a local trough, right? Um, the S and P 500, which is really a you know more of a large cap, broadly diversified index, um, I think on an intraday basis has kind of breached that 20% drawdown. Where you know the Nasdaq has been, um, I think its peak to trough is closer to 30%, and I, I think it's still in the like you know mid 20s or low 20s as far as like um, drawdown from its most recent high. Um, you know most of that is. So what does that mean for high growth sectors? You know, right now we've had a big compression in price to earnings multiples and valuation multiples like price to revenue um, or enterprise value to revenue. Um, it's largely the result of the market um, starting to reflect an increase in cost of capital driven by the latest sort of Federal Reserve interest rate hiking cycle. Um, so lower multiples means um, higher cost of capital. So money's gonna be more expensive. I think the nearest term impact for high growth sectors like the identity is really gonna be in KYC and onboarding. Um, we have a risk re-rating. So we're gonna, less money is now gonna be allocated to perceived high risk projects. Um, that's VC world, like just plain and simple. We're gonna see less dollars flowing into customer acquisition. Um, it's gonna be more expensive to acquire customers. Um, and VCs are now going to be less willing to subsidize that. So I think looking back over the last year or two, the high flyers that we've been talking about have all been in kind of the onboarding space. And that's tied to things like um, instant or, or rapid delivery services, groceries, food, um, 
some of the different investing platforms, Robinhood, Coinbase, crypto broadly. Um, I think there's going to be less dollars on the equity financing side available to them. And I think there's also going to be less customer interest in them. Um, so I think those companies are ones where it's going to be interesting to see what happens. You know, COVID pulled, we, you know, a year ago, we were talking about how much demand COVID pulled forward and these really phenomenal year over year growth comps that companies were putting up 200, 300% sometimes that investors were then extrapolating out into the future. Um, and now people are going to revisit those assumptions. And if you go from assuming that a company grows 200 to 300% a year to say just, you know, a middling 30 or 40% per year, you're going to find that, you know, that's, um, you know, a 10 X reduction. You're going to find, you may find that the price, um, um, the price to sales ratio that investors are willing to pay for a business um, is also going to be reduced 10 times. So, you know, people were talking about companies um, being valued at 50 to hundred times a year ago. Now we're seeing things, people talking about, you know, companies are going to be worth five to 10 times revenue and just clearing that 10 times threshold, which was taken for granted in VC land for a while is now going to become something that's actually um, something that perhaps is maybe not impossible to get, but at least um, tough to get, or is going to really require some hard effort. So I think we are going to see, we are going to see just kind of a re-rating and revaluation of how much investors are willing to pay for growth. Um, and we're also going to see a revisitation of what that growth assumption is. So both of those things kind of have a, um, a reflexive feedback loop on, on uh, investing in, in sort of startup land and, and in, in particular identity. I think that's extremely, that's extremely interesting. Uh, I, I was just going to echo those sentiments. I, I didn't want to uh, step on, on some of Dave's future wisdom uh, based on our, our pre-recording uh, conversations. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's going to begin shaking out uh, some of the hands that have been reliant on, uh, you know, VC pumping a bunch of dollars into segments like, you know, I don't know, pick a, pick a sector, 15 minute delivery customer onboarding, right? Uh, if that well of uh, unlimited $30 coupons dries up, you're going to start seeing that ripple effect flowing down into all of the other providers living, uh, you know, in that ecosystem. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Tend to take us to the, to the next question here, which is, you know, what are some market indicators that you're watching to make decisions? You just talked about, both of you guys just talked about uh, some of the different use cases that identity companies are, are trying to tackle. Uh, not necessarily those are indicators, but maybe those specific use cases have indicators. But I guess, you know, what are some of the market indicators? And we can go from identity indicators to maybe Cameron, you can talk a little bit about some of your thoughts on what you're, what you're looking at. And then uh, Dave, really just curious again, you know, kind of your finance take on some of the market indicators that you're keeping an eye on uh, for the market broadly, yep. specifically private market, mar private company market broadly, and as well as for identity. So Cameron, what are your thoughts on indicators and, and what are you watching right now? Yeah, you know, I think looking at some of the industries that have been bellwethers for this surge in onboarding, whether it's ride sharing, whether it's crypto, uh, looking to those to see, you know, our volumes of new accounts, our transaction volumes uh, going to start plummeting and, and extrapolate that out into what that means for some of the platforms that have been overly reliant maybe on, on a handful of super high growth sectors to, uh, to hit their numbers quarter over quarter. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, you know, my you know, market indicators. You know, the biggest thing I, I think probably most people are familiar with this right now is that you know a lot of this is being driven by inflation and inflationary expectations. Um, so, what I would encourage people to do when they're reading sort of the financial news and economic reports is not just pay attention to what inflation is, but what is inflation relative to expectations. Um, and and typically, you'll see financial news reporters discuss you know what consensus is before a big major economic release. And then they'll, you know, they'll talk about how the market is then moving um, and they'll define that narratively through how things were relative to expectations. So I think the thing to pay attention to right now is like, how long are people expecting inflation to persist for and why, what, what are the implicit assumptions and then why that might, why might that be wrong, right? Um, and I think there's a number of things to look at where inflation, there's, 
plenty to read and look at where inflation could end up being higher persistently, persistently high, or it could end up, or it could still end up being somewhat transitory. transitory. And by that, I mean, it could be tamped down within a 12 month cycle. Um, some of the things we're seeing is we're starting to see there's been a shift from, you know, during COVID, everybody was buying goods. So a lot of, a lot of inflation was what has been in the price of goods. And now we're seeing people reallocate from goods to services, more travel, more dining out, things like that. And so some of the inflation expectations are really weighted towards um, one consumer bucket or the other. And so it's not necessary. It's not true at this point in time that inflation is just broad based and everywhere. We're seeing inflation cool and in certain areas like the price of used cars, um, certain goods prices are actually are starting to come down. But then the things that are concerning are obviously food and energy, which are largely driven by um, by the, the conflict in Ukraine and, and both Russia's role as, as a world energy supplier and Ukraine's role as something like, which is not something I knew prior to this conflict, but they supply something like 25% of the world's wheat. So um, that's going to have huge knock on impacts. And so I think those are ultimately the things to watch. Um, you know, the time frame that I would say is like, I don't think people should be day traders. Um, but, it, you know, so like you don't need to watch this stuff on a daily basis, but I think you need to think about the things that you're reading on a weekly basis and then think forward six to 12 months. Um, taking that to VC world, people are talking a lot about down rounds right now, um, but we're not really going to see down rounds happen because nobody takes a down round until they have to. So for everybody that's raised at these really inflated evaluations and raised huge rounds in the last kind of 12 to 18 months, um, they're hopefully, unless they're really spending like drunken sailors, they're going to have cash for, you know, a couple of years. And so there's going to be a lot of startups that are going to be able to weather this, um, even if perhaps they did um, raise at an inflated valuation that then now they need to in, earn into. They're going to have time to do that. Um, for the VCs themselves, that's going to delay when they need to mark to market their portfolio. Um, and I think a lot of VCs right now are, you know, previously we, um, the fundraising cycle, just like, you know, startups have a fundraising cycle where they're raising every, you know, typically it's been 12 to 18 months or 12, you know, 24, maybe a little longer, depending on your cycle. Consumers a little shorter, enterprise, it's usually a little longer. Um, VCs have a fundraising cycle of their own with LPs. Um, prior to the last kind of five years of this frothier market environment, VCs typically raised on like a three-year cycle and invested funds over that three years and then spent the rest of the, the fund life on, on portfolio management. In recent years, it's been much more like a 12 to 18 month fundraising cycle where the likes of, you know, Sequoia, Andreessen, and Excel, you know, those people were raising on an almost annual basis. I'm um, certainly Tiger Global, who we're going to talk about, has been raising on an annual basis. So um, those, that fundraising life cycle is also now going to become more drawn out, um, which means you are going to have less dollars available to the market. And so everybody's going to kind of take this wait and see approach. And you just have to watch how that flows through. And you have to recognize that each of these things sort of impacts the other. And so as far as indicators in the next three to six months, I'm watching inflation and I'm trying to thoughtfully read inflation reports to see where are things high and where are things cooling. Um, and then it's really going to be over a 12 to 18 month cycle that, or, that we're real or time frame that we're really actually going to understand how is this actually affecting um, the VC, both investment cycle and then the fundraising or the capital raising for the funds themselves. Um, so that's the kind of like the lens that I have at this moment in time. Yeah. And I think both of those, I think all of those ideas are, are extremely grounded in reality. You know, from, from my end, looking at, uh, at the market right now, it is a little bit longer term. Look, we were, before the market went bear, if we're going to call it a bear market here, uh, which I think we should, um, you know, we we're, we we're saying that, hey, there's this consolidation that's about to start happening, right? Acquisitions are starting to be happening. We're going to see more companies acquiring the technology, the IP that support their solution in market. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of that. So I think there's some false indicators that are going to start to spring up here, which are acquisitions with undisclosed valuations. I think those were probably going to happen regardless. Um, and so we may see more of those deals happen, but I don't think that is a strong indicator for how our current market and identity is, um, is doing well or not doing well, just because uh, those are things that were already in process. 
And I think the, the last question we have here from the audience, which is what is your advice to startup founders and investors with money at stake in the identity market right now? Obviously, I think, you know, both of you guys gave some pretty good I ideas around what market indicators you're interested in. Obviously, that's pretty good advice to startup founders and investors. But generally speaking, you know, Cameron, what advice do you have given everything that you're seeing right now? For that founder that you know might be at uh, might be saying, "Hey, I need to go raise some cash," or you know, even even yet, maybe the founder that says, <clears throat> hey, "I have cash, but I'm worried uh, that this is going to continue to continue to be hard a hard market to raise funds in for 12 months." Great question. Look, uh, far be it from me to. Uh be uh, the, the expert here in, in terms of fundraising, I think I might defer somewhat to, uh, to you and Dave on that subject matter. But the advice that I would give them that they came to me is focus on the core of your business. Uh, I think there are folks who got caught out chasing, you know, uh, hockey sticks in, in areas like crypto that were, I think, too good to be true. And, and if you took those numbers at face value, I think somewhat uh, unsustainable. You know, you you just are not going to see a market segment with like 100% year over year user growth that can continue indefinitely. There's only so many people uh, in the world to join these platforms. So, you know, I think for the companies that are looking on uh, looking at how to get through this market, it's focusing on the core product and focusing on building a, a broad base uh, to build your growth upon and not just chasing, you know, home run shots. Um, mixing some metaphors here, but, you know, take your, take your at-bats slow and steady. Uh, don't swing at the first pitch that you see uh, and look to, you know, diversify the areas of growth that your business can focus on so that you don't get caught out when, you know, I don't know, uh, crypto drops another 20% and there's no growth to be found, you know, diversify which segments you're playing in and, and look at some of these more holistic cross application uses for digital identity that we've been beating the drum about uh, to maybe be that bridge over troubled water for you. Yeah. Uh, Dave, what do you, I mean, what are your thoughts for investors here? I mean, do you have any, do you have any thoughts for investors on, on how they should be thinking about the current market? Um, well, look, I mean, I, as, as far as investors, I think I would echo uh, the comments um, kind of I made above around just like, how, you, how carefully you actually need to read inflation reports and refrain from, um, in particular in this country, projecting political narratives onto what's happening with inflation and markets, right? So, um, you know, the whole world is experiencing inflation. So everybody likes to say right now that, you know, this is either the fault of the Federal Reserve or this is um, the result of Democrats spending like drunken sailors because they control the legislative and the executive branch. Um, but inflation is not a U.S. phenomenon right now. So um, while the Federal Reserve and their interest rate hiking cycle in response to inflation is certainly driving the market currently, it is not correct to um, assume that historical political and policy actions uh, have produced this inflation. Which I guess that's my kind of like personal bugaboo when I just listen to people about like who are people who I want to listen to or not. I think when I hear these like political framing when I hear political framing to the discourse, I kind of just reject that outright. And I say, well, look, I mean, uh, you know, you, you, you know, like I said before, Ukraine, the Russia-Ukraine conflict has played a big role and the whole world is exp experiencing inflation right now, not just the US. So it's not just about US policy and politics. Um, one thing I do want to come back to though is for, is for founders, um, you know, people used to talk, you know, people always say, you know, know your unit economics, but also understand your capital efficiency. And so for those that haven't, particularly those who are at the seed or maybe perhaps even Series A stage, um, what I would encourage you to read and Google are articles written by other VC firms, um, one of which is Bessemer and their efficiency score, um, and then Craft Ventures burn multiple. Both of them are ratios that try to relate. Um, both of those are attempts to quantify capital efficiency, specifically by framing how much new ARR you're generating um, and how much you're spending to generate that new ARR. Right. So are you, yes, great. You're growing, but like, you know, are you selling dollars for, for 65 cents or are you actually like, you know, doing something that generates real value and you're doing that in like a thoughtful and considerate way. 
So I would read both those two articles and I would absolutely learn those ratios and make sure that you're calculating them in your fundraising decks. Um, and then, you know, Andreessen Horowitz also put out a recent article called like how to weather a downturn, which has all sorts of like great advice and people should read that. So we don't need to repackage that all here, but I would say like, if you're a founder, like go read that stuff, like you need to know it. Nice. I think, yeah, all very, very helpful advice. Also, I love the word uh, bugaboo. Uh, I'm going to just start throwing that into <laughs> regular conversation going forward. Look, I think this is a, is a huge topic. We wanted to spend the majority of our time talking about it. Uh, obviously, this is what we spend most of our day here at Liminal, helping companies think through CEOs and investors alike. You know, how does this particular market play a role uh, into their growth or existence, frankly, over the next two years. So if you, uh, if you listen to this and you have some additional questions, would love to definitely talk to you uh, more about that. You can reach us out directly uh, at the uh, info at liminal.co channel. So let's go ahead and start with the LexisNexis and BehaviorSec acquisition. So here, obviously, you know, uh, covers quite a, a big chunk of the map already. LexisNexis for Solutions or LNRS is a prolific player in the space. Um, obviously, one of those incumbents that has just continued to dominate the market in terms of product awareness, uh, product feature set, and acquisitions. They bolted on some really large chunks to this business over the past uh, past five, six years that have been pretty meaningful. Things like threat metrics, as an example, that put them really above uh, above the rest in, in terms of just thoughtful strategy. Um, but of, of course, the other big players like Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion have, have made very similar moves and have done a very good job at not, not just staying relevant, but competing meaningfully well. But this acquisition of BehavioSec, I think, is a really interesting and strong move for LexisNexis. Obviously, we are covering at the top section of our map, BehavioSec, in that lighter blue LexisNexis resolutions in the darker blue. For BehavioSec, you know, having them in authentication, biometrics, fraud detection, and prevention solution segments, these are solution segments that are square in this landscape, right? So you can't really go wrong with beefing these solutions up, acquiring new IP, being able to find new ways to service your customers in this part of the map. Uh, it also seems to be a nice bridge that opens LexisNexis up to other areas of this map, whether that's customer IAM, or something on the data privacy and consent management side, building out some more identity graphing and resolution components. Really, this is a very strong position. So really like this acquisition from my end, but Cameron, what are your thoughts on LexisNexis and BehavioSec? Look, I think we've seen this in the behavioral biometrics space for some time. Uh, it is not that behavioral biometrics isn't a technology that has promise and application. Uh, it's something that is challenging to sell as a standalone product because to do something meaningful with those signals that come out of a behavioral biometric solution, you need tight integrations with your IAM piece, with the rest of your fraud detection and prevention suite, uh, with your identity proofing, your mobile identity and device intelligence. And so if you are offering a solution that is just uh, a standalone you know, widget, as it were, uh, it can be really tough to see it implemented successfully, and more critically for customers to see the value in adopting that solution. So the fact that BehavioSec is rolling into the broader LNRS platform, uh, which encompasses so much of the landscape that we see here today, I think makes a tremendous amount of sense. Because, you know, if, if LNRS can get the integration right, which, you know, I think, uh, I wouldn't bet against them in doing, uh, they can really begin layering in all of the best uh, features that behavioral bi biometrics has to offer, which in my opinion are an extremely low level of friction for good customers. It's not necessarily that it's going to pop bad guys that you wouldn't have otherwise caught. It's that your good guys, your good customers can breeze right in and not even think that they've been uh, challenged at all because the website recognizes that they're not a, a bot you know, they're from a trusted geolocation and IP address, a device we've seen before, you can come right in and transact. Uh, I think that adds a really powerful, you know, arrow to LNRS's quiver, which I think previously has been anchored a bit more heavily on those deterministic elements on, um, you know, uh, traditional 
uh, credit or, or uh, you know, identity attribute based um, approaches and platforms. So this is a great, uh, great addition for them and, and really excited about what this portends for the breadth uh, of the solutions they're able to offer. Yeah, that's a really great point. I don't know, Dave, do you have anything else to add here? I, generally, I think very well said, I would emphasize Cameron's point about challenges of selling. Um, you know, ultimately challenge, the challenge is when you sell something that's, you know, a set of features and not truly a product, um, it's tough to go to market. And so I think we've seen that happen with um, a number of different behavioral biometrics players and, and some of the acquisitions, right? That this, these are ultimately a set of features, not um, not something that's, you know, just sort of a standalone product. Um, and so it's yeah. tough. No, that's a good point. And you know, <clears throat> as we get closer to summit or to the summer here, we typically take a, a good look back at the landscape and see what we need to change. And there's a few ubiquitous features uh, as solution segment types on here, biometrics and authentication, both being those ubiquitous features as we see some of those feature sets uh, proliferating across multiple solution segments. So, you know, maybe they'll be on the map next year, maybe they won't be, but we definitely expect to see more of these product features um, in all of the different product solutions across every vertical, frankly. So it's a, it's a really great point. And with that, let's go ahead and um, put this one in the books. I guess, you know, we have, as far as Liminal is concerned, we have a couple of latest, or latest research reports on our website. Uh, if you haven't already, take a look at the reusable identity and how to get their market opportunity research report. We published that back in February. Continues to be a major driver for conversation, product roadmaps, strategy thinking. Um, so if you haven't already downloaded that one and read it, uh, that would be definitely the one we'd recommend. And then for our members, we have the crypto economy and its roles in the digital identity ecosystem. That's our latest outside in report. We have a few more coming up, which I'll talk about here in a second. And then our recent blogs, of course, we have the digital identity landscape uh, for this year. That's the one we've been using during this identity in uh, investing in identity form. So, but if you want to dig into it, we have an entire microsite dedicated to breaking down each of the solution segments and what Golden Cog strategy is and a few videos to help break down this, uh, this framework for you to use in your day-to-day. -day. And then last but not least, what to look forward at Liminal. So we have our Identity Networks OAR. This is member-only content. Again, outside in report OAR. And so right now we're looking at, you know, the Signacats of the world, how are identity networks starting to form, starting to uh, be successful in terms of new business model iterations really interesting. We, we've combined probably the past 12 months of work into this OIR. Uh, really interesting content should be coming out over the next week and a half for our members. We have our liminal summer networking event, uh, again, for our member content. So you'll be able to, uh, you, if you're a member, you'll be receiving an email shortly about that. And then last but not least, we have our other outside in report coming out here in June on PI conditions. So personal identity ecosystem, conditions. So what are those conditions? We've identified five, uh, five conditions, privacy, data protection, reputation, commerce, and inclusion. So you'll be able to read more about how we're working with product managers to build consumer identity products that work. And all right, and that will take us to the conclusion of the this month's investing and identity forum. Thank you again, Cameron and Dave for joining uh, for this great discussion. And we'll look forward to seeing everybody in our next form in June. Thank you.